Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, an overview of a novel RNA scope in situ hybridization technology and applications in pathology of animal models. I am Marie Stone of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by ACD, a biotechnic brand. To learn more, visit acdbio.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. This webinar is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education window at the bottom of your screen to obtain your credits. I'd like to now welcome our speakers. Dr. Anushka Dixit, Application Scientist at Advanced Cell Diagnostics, and Dr. Sebastian Monet, Veterinary Pathologist and the Head of Anatomic Pathology at the Laboratory of Comparative Pathology. Anushka and Sebastian, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you for that introduction. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today to learn about our spatial platform, which allows you to profile your target RNA with single cell and tissue context. So for those of you who have not heard about this platform, the RNA scope technology is primarily an in situ hybridization assay that was designed to overcome the tedious uh, homebrew-ish assays, which were very difficult to perform, uh, provided um, low to moderate quality results and very nonspecific signal. So we have designed this technology to bypass all of those uh, tedious, cumbersome processes and provided a highly streamlined, simple, easy to work with platform, which provides that high signal to noise ratio and allows you to visualize your RNA biomarkers. So first and foremost, why is it important to use a spatial platform? Uh, over the last decade, it's been more and more evident that in addition to having highly specific and sensitive technologies, it's important to visualize your target genes or proteins with a tissue and spatial context. This is important because it allows you to understand where your targets are expressing and how the cells are oriented with respect to each other in a complex tissue environment. <clears throat> Understanding cellular organization is extremely important to understand the fundamental function of an organ or tissue system or understand the underlying molecular mechanism behind a pathological condition. This is true in a lot of research areas, include cancer biology, neuroscience, inflammation research, uh, neurodegenerative disorders, and developmental biology. So when you use a platform that provides you that spatial and tissue context, it allows you to understand where in the tissue is your target expressing and how is it interacting with neighboring cells to uh, provide the function that it's meant to execute. Overall, in the last few years, there have been a lot of uh, large cell consortia that have developed to build cell atlases for uh, different tissues. And when you're doing this, the go-to method is your single cell RNA sequencing because it allows you to study gene expression at a single cell level and profile all the different cell types that make up an organ. But once you have this information, it's also important to understand how these unique cells are present within the tissue and how are they arranged with respect to their surrounding uh, cells. And that's when a spatial platform comes into play. 
where now that you have that single cell information, you want to see how these cells are oriented in the tissue and how your targets are expressing within these target cells. So having recognized that RNA scope technology has been around for a decade now, providing high quality spatial analysis solutions to look at target RNA biomarkers. The key to our technology is our probe design strategy. And in this next slide, I'm going to go over why we pride ourselves in our probe design strategy. Here, we are depicting a standard RNA scope probe as a Z molecule. And you have three different regions of the Z molecule highlighted here. The target binding site, which has a sequence that's complementary to your target sequence. Then you have the preamplifier binding site, which forms the basis or foundation of building the amplification tree, and then a linker region which connects these two sequences. So as you can see, we design our probes in pairs such that when you apply your probes to your tissue, the probes will bind as a pair of Zs onto your target sequence. And you will have multiple pairs of Zs that bind along your target sequence followed by which you will have your preamplifier that will bind to your Z pair. Then you will have the amplifier <clears throat> which binds onto the preamplifier, followed by which you will have your labeled probes, which can either be chromogenic or fluorescent. Now, this is how we build our amplification tree on top of the probe to give high level of sensitivity, where even the most low expressing targets can be visualized. But how do we ensure specificity? As I mentioned, for the preamplifier to bind to the Z pair, of, to the Z probe, the two Z probes have to bind in tandem as a pair on top of the target sequence. If the, Z do, the Zs do not bind as a pair next to each other, the preamplifier cannot bind to a single Z molecule. As a result, if a Z molecule or a Z probe non-specifically binds to a sequence, the preamplifier will not be able to bind to it and there won't be any amplification tree formed. As a result, there won't be any signal detected. And this combination ensures very high signal to noise ratio with very minimal background. So overall, under the RNA scope technology umbrella, we now have four different assays. We have our standard parent RNA scope assay, which is for targets that are over 300 nucleotides in length. Then we have our base scope assay, which is a more specialized assay that's designed for targets between 17, uh, sorry, 50 to 300 nucleotides in length. We then have our microRNA scope assay, which is for targets between 17 to uh, 50 nucleotides in length. And as the name suggests, is for uh, those small RNA molecules like siRNAs, microRNAs, and ASOs. And finally, very recently, we have crossed the barrier of uh, the RNA biomolecules into DNA and are now able to detect genomic DNA using our DNA scope assay. And the main applications for this is to detect uh, viral integrations, copy number variations, and um, gene fusion. So based on your research interest and your research question, you can pick any of these assays that would best help uh, detect your target of interest. In this next slide, I just wanted to show how well adopted we are across different research and application areas. And one of the main reasons for this is because this technology is applicable for a large range of sample types, which include your FFPE samples, fixed and fresh frozen tissues, PBMCs, cultured cells, and so forth. Additionally, we are uh, you're able to apply this technology to long non-coding RNAs, your standard mRNAs, short mRNAs, circular mRNAs, point mutations, etc. And because of that, we've been extensively used for detection of GPCR, especially in neuroscience research, where antibodies are very unreliable for these targets, uh, to detect secreted factors, soluble factors like cytokines, chemokines, and growth factors, uh, which are secreted 
And if you want to identify the cellular source of these factors, you can use this technology. One of our biggest applications, which I'll also talk about in the next few slides, is validation of single cell sequencing data. As I alluded to in our introduction, this assay is used downstream of single cell sequencing to visualize the novel cells or targets identified uh, by single cell sequencing assays. We have been also extensively used for detection of CDR3 sequences on TCRs, which, as you know, is a big application uh, in T cell therapy research. Finally, with our new DNA scope assay, as I mentioned, we can look at gene fusions, we can study um, archival FFPE uh, cancer uh, tumor samples to understand, retro do ret retrospective analysis about uh, mutation signatures and um, treatment efficacy. And finally, we have been used across all these research areas like neuroscience, developmental biology, cancer research, immune oncology, inflammation research, gene therapy, cell therapy, and infectious disease research. For today's introduction of the technology, I'm going to show you uh, a few examples of how we've been applied uh, within few of these research and application areas. We'll start with uh, one of our major applications, which is validation of single cell RNA sequencing data. And we're going to look at an example of how we validated a paper that came out in 2016, which talked about um, identifying neuronal subtypes in the mouse brain cortex. And we use this information to uh, visualize these targets, visualize these targets uh, at single cell level. So in this slide, you can see the workflow which shows how bulk tissue analysis can provide single cell information when you perform single cell RNA sequencing. But if you want to validate that data downstream, you have to perform orthogonal downstream validation. And our new Hyplex assay is perfectly suited to do that, wherein you will take the information you get from single cell sequencing and identify a few key targets and then visualize them using our Hyplex assay. This particular workflow has been used extensively to uh, spatially map cell atlases, visualize novel cell types, uh, determine the heterogeneous uh, nature of certain targets in complex tissues, characterize immune cell landscape, and so forth. In this next example, we are going to see how we design probes against key targets for um, neuronal subtypes in this mouse cortex and visualize them with single cell um, resolution. So here, as you can see, we pick targets that are specific to the D1 subtype of the medium spiny neuron and a set of targets specific to the D2 subtype of the medium spiny neuron. And then we pick two targets shown here in brown, which are common for both D1 and D2. And we wanted to visualize these in the mouse cortex. So as you saw in that quick animation, we are able to visualize each and every one of those targets with single cell resolution. And here is a composite image of all those targets visualized together, where you can now differentiate between the D1 population and the D2 population of neurons and look at the various subtypes within these two main populations. And you can do this by uh, visualizing these target genes that are specific to each of those subpopulations. And our registration software, which comes with our Hyplex assays, allows you to look at these uh, uh, and toggle on and off between these targets to study those individual populations. So in the next example, we are going to see how this technology can also be applied to look at various immune cells. As I mentioned, immune cell uh, activation is dependent on the type of cytokines they're secreting and the uh, receptors they're expressing. With this particular assay, you can visualize both. 
you can look at the cytokine expression and you can look at the receptor expression. So in this next example, I'm going to show you another workflow uh, of our RNA scope technology, wherein our ish assays can be combined with immunofluorescence or immunohistochemistry to visualize RNA and protein biomarkers simultaneously. In this particular example, we have used our new RNA protein co-detection kit, which allows you to optimally visualize both your RNA and protein targets. Here, we have assembled a combination of antibodies and probes to look at certain tumor tissues. In the first combination, we have used our CD68 antibody with CD163 and it can probe to look at macrophages. And the second combination, we have used CD8 antibody with interferon gamma and granazine B probe. So here is an example of uh, when we used our co detection assay to look at target cells within head and neck tumor and kidney tumors. And in the zoomed in area, you can clearly see the signal in red is your CD68 antibody staining. And the signal in green is CD163, and signal in blue is its cam. So based on the combination of expression of these markers, um, you can identify whether potentially a M1 or M2 macrophage. Here you can see nice co-localization of CD68 with CD163, potentially suggesting it might be a M2 macrophage. Similarly, in this kidney tumor, you can see very strong expression of CD163 in this particular cell. Um, so these are the type of uh, analyses you can perform using this co-detection assay, where you use an immune cell-specific antibody marker, and you use target gene um, RNA scope probes to identify subtypes of immune cells. In this next example, we have applied the same assay to look at uh, cytotoxic T lymphocytes, where you're now looking at uh, CD8 positive cells in red, and you're looking at expression of soluble factors like interferon gamma and granazine B, uh, suggesting the activated state of these T cells. So here this cell marked in the purple arrow indicates a triple positive cell, which is a potentially active T cell in this tumor. So this is really great where you can identify specific subtypes but a lot of the times, uh, researchers are really interested in visualizing multiple subtypes simultaneously on the same section of the tissue. And so we heard what researchers wanted from us, and we developed this new version of the Hyplex assay, which can now be used in FFPE tissue. And we are calling it the Hyplex version 2 assay, which can be used in fresh frozen, fixed frozen, uh, and FFPE tissues alike. So what we have done with this new version of the assay is pretty much kept the workflow the same, but we have introduced a FFPE reagent to ensure that there is minimal to no autofluorescence from the FFPE tissues. Because FFPE tissues are known for high autofluorescence, and the last thing we want is the real signal getting marked by autofluorescence. So our research scientists have really worked hard and optimized this assay to work on FFPE tissues, where you can now visualize 12 targets simultaneously. And here is an example in ovarian cancer tumor, where we have selected key immune oncology targets, like your immune cell markers, key cytokines, chemokines, uh, your hypoxia markers, uh, to be visualized in this tumor microenvironment. And as you can see, you can actually visualize where there's high degree of T cell infiltration versus where there's high levels of macrophages present in this tumor. And furthermore, with our registration software, you can pick which targets you want to visualize at a time. And in this particular image, I have only selected my key T cell specific targets, which include CD3 cells, CD8 positive cells, interferon, and CD1. So these are your key T cell markers. And now I can specifically say where exactly are the T cells present and which one of these are your CD8 positive cytotoxic T cells. So this is how you can toggle between your target genes and identify exactly where 
your immune cell population of interest is present in this tumor microenvironment. So this is just one example. You can really play around with this and identify your um, cell type of interest and study their uh, organization within uh, any complex tissue. An interesting feature of this assay, again, is that although we have been able to plex it up to 12 in SFPE, we have not lost the sensitivity and specificity of the assay. Where again, we can go down to that single cell, single molecule resolution and really hold in on those specific subtype of immune cells and identify where these cells are present in your target tumor. So finally, I want to touch upon um, an application which is preclinical safety and uh, activity assessment of CAR T cells. Now, this is a very important application as more and more CAR T research is happening to develop uh, CAR T therapies in solid tumors. So we have, we've seen some success in um, uh, leukemia and lymphoma, but we want to see if CAR T cells can really be effective in solid tumors. And to address that, we, we collaborated a couple of years back with Bluebird Bio in Cambridge, where they were developing certain CAR T therapies and wanted to use our technology to assess the safety and efficacy of these treatments. So here is a uh, depiction of how we um, assisted them in achieving that goal. We developed a CAR-specific RNA scope probe, which would specifically detect the CAR vector of these CAR T cell therapies. And ultimately, we treated these uh, treated mice with these CAR T cell therapies and wanted to see how these CAR T cells react in a preclinical model. So there were two CAR T cell therapies developed, one against the BCMA antigen and the other against the ROR1 antigen. So first we'll see how uh, this treatment worked against the BCMA antigen. So in this image on your left-hand side, you see um, a staining done on the xenograft tumor of this mouse, where we have the, we have a used a probe against granazine B and a probe against the CAR UTR. And as you can see, you can detect the CAR T cells marked in red, and also see that granazine B expression is very high, which indicates these CAR T cells are active and mounting a strong immune response. And that's only because the BCMA antigen is present in the xenograft tumor. Uh, we also use our multiplex assay and combined it with immunofluorescence to differentiate endogenous CAR T cells, uh, endogenous T cells marked in white from CAR T cells marked in green. So you can use any of these assays to really help address the question you're interested in. Here, we were able to show that the CAR T cells are present and active, secreting granizyme B and interferon gamma. On the other hand, uh, the ROR1 therapy did not work as well, where we saw that it had some nonspecific effects, which was causing pulmonary toxicity in these mice. So overall, this study was very successful. It showed uh, that the ROR1 uh, treatment was not as effective, but the BCMA treatment was effective and um, showed very strong response in this preclinical model. So this is the last example, and hopefully today I've been able to show you that this technology is highly specific uh, and sensitive in detecting targets of your interest. We have over 35,000 probes in our catalog against a wide range of targets. We can flex up to 12 for FFPE and up to 48 for fixed and fresh frozen tissues, and we can detect small RNA targets as well. Finally, we have tweaked our technology to be compatible with our immunofluorescence and IHC assays, so you can visualize protein and RNA targets simultaneously. And with that, I will now turn the platform back to our moderator uh, for our next talk. Thank you, Anushka, for the um, great introduction to the technology. This is Sebastian, uh, and thank you, Mary, for the um, introduction earlier and the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm going to move on to my presentation. So, uh, as Mary mentioned, I am a veterinary pathologist. Um, 
at uh, a core facility called the Laboratory of Comparative Pathology. Uh, so we are a multi-institutional core facility in New York City. So we're affiliated with Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, the Hospital for Special Surgery, the Rockefeller University, and the Weill Cornell Medical College. Um, so before I talk about how we've been using this technology in our core lab, I just wanted to give a brief overview of um, our workflow and what we do, just so you can get a better idea of how this technology fits within our activities. So really, the um, the core of our services uh, is our team of four pathologists. Um, so we are four board certified veterinary pathologists specialized in animal models, and we support a large number of users uh, at our institution by doing um, slide interpretation for a wide variety of preclinical studies. But we also in our lab have um, the uh, facilities and the staff to assist people with the entire workflow. So uh, this starts with uh, most, in most cases, submission of the entire animals to our lab. So we do perform the necropsy, tissue harvest and fixation, slide preparation. So we really do this so that we can assist people with these um, steps and also we can perform this in a standardized manner that is optimal for our pathology assessment. Um, then the slides go to our pathologist for slide interpretation and pathology reporting. And also in a subset of studies, uh, we will uh, perform some form of image analysis. In addition to the pathology assessment, we will perform some form of image analysis with software to characterize um, various features within the um, sections. And this is typically done by scanning the slides, generating whole slide images. So being pathologists, we, um, the, the bulk of what we do is really interpreting histopathology sections, making diagnoses. So um, our routine slides that we use in most cases are h &E slide sections. However, we do uh, incorporate in many of our studies uh, some form of detection of markers or targets of interest in tissue sections. And by markers or targets, I mean um, either protein that we can detect by using antibodies for immunohistochemistry or immunofluorescence, or RNA by um, using RNA probe with in situ hybridization using the uh, RNA scope assay. Um, just uh, some common examples of when and how or why we need to detect uh, targets within tissue sections. Um, our most common uh, needs are uh, include uh, some examples that Anushka already showed. So for example, characterizing immune cell infiltrates in the tumor microenvironment, that's something we do very commonly. We also do a lot of CAR T cell studies. And in some of those, um, we need to do exactly what Anushka, Anushka showed, which is to assess the target distribution of the CAR T cells so we can better understand and assess uh, things like uh, of tumor on target toxicity. Um, so then there's really the question when we start planning these experiments, are we going to detect the protein with IHC or the RNA with ISH? And um, in some cases, clearly, based on the scientific question, um, one or the other is more appropriate. So sometimes, you know, there's no choice really it's because of um, some reason specific to this study, we're only interested in the protein or only in the RNA. But in many cases, um, we're, we consider both options equally. Uh, they're both um, potentially appropriate. We know that uh, in many cases, if the protein is, is expressed, is there, we also expect to see the RNA. So then we really have a choice. And what I want to talk about today is um, how do we make this choice? What are the advantages of ISH over IHC? Um, for our people, for our pathologists and our user, IHC is still for them often the default. It's still often the first thing they ask for. Um, I think one of the main reasons is they're more familiar with it. Uh, we've been doing IHC in our lab for decades. Um, RNA-ish is newer. Uh, we started doing it with RNA scope a few years ago. Also with IHC, often we already have the antibody or people have an antibody they're familiar with. So um, it's often the first choice, but what I want to show you today is that clearly there are some cases where there are very marked advantages and uh, we will want to use ISH instead of IHC. Um, for us, 
they're both they are both performed in a very similar manner. This uh, image shows the automated standard that we use in our lab. It's the Lycabond RX platform. Um, it works both for IHC and RNA scope itch. Um, the same technicians that were already trained and experienced with IHC, uh, they're able to very easily run the ish. It's it's um, it's run in a very similar manner, and also on the same type of uh, formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue sections. So to illustrate this, um, I wanted to use this example. So this is a study uh, in which um, we use a um, in which a syngenic B16 melanoma mouse model was used. And uh, this is uh, from one of the labs here at MSK. So I want to thank our user and collaborator, Gil Wang from the Wolchuk Lab for letting me use this example. In this study, he had um, two groups of mice with B16 melanoma implanted in the flank. Um, the two groups where uh, there was a control group, there was a group that was treated with something that I'm not going to discuss today, but basically they were comparing the two groups um, using various characteristics of these tumors. And, and one of those, aspects in these studies was assessing some targets. So we did use RNA probes for ish staining for these three targets that I'm showing here, CXCL10, IL10, and TGF-beta. The first thing that you can appreciate, um, and what one aspect of this that we really like as pathologists, is that we can see not only um, if the target is expressed and how, how intensely or how much of the target is expressed, but we can also see our tissue morphology in the tissue section. Um, so we can see our histopathologic features. I can see that not only the target is expressed, but I can see, for example, in CXCL10, that the red signal for the RNA target is within the tumor cell, within mostly the cytoplasm of the tumor cells. The pattern is very different in IL-10. I don't have signal in the tumor cells. However, I do have intense signal in a small number of smaller cells that appear to be in between the tumor cells. These most likely are some type of immune cell that um, we could characterize exactly which type they are with further staining. And then finally, in TGF-beta, you can see some very small numbers of faint dots in the tumor cells. So there is a small amount of RNA within the, the tumor cells of this melanoma, but the most intense staining is within the blood vessels. Uh, it appears to be mostly in the endothelial cells of the, of the blood vessel. So already I can see qualitatively that um, there's very different source of the RNA between these three markers within the same tumor. Um, but this is not unique to ISH. Um, this is IHC. So in the same project on the same tumors, we did IHC for some immune cell markers, uh, including CD3, CD8, and FOXP3 for various populations of lymphocytes and F480 for macrophages. Um, I also get my tissue morphology in IHC. So um, then the question is, why did I choose to do IHC in these cases and ish for the other markers? Um, for these immune cell marker, these are stains that are very commonly requested in our labs. So we have um, antibodies that we keep in stock. We have well-optimized stains. We feel that these, in most cases, work well for us. So that's why, in this case, we use IHC. But why did we use um, why did we use the ish for the other three markers? So these three markers were, in the case of IL-10 and CXCL-10, we had never stained for them. This was the first time we had this request. In the case of TGF-beta, we had done in the past immunostochemistry using a, a few different antibodies. Um, the results were never that great, so we really wanted to achieve something better. Um, so really having a request for novel markers. We know that um, if we need to start to find antibodies, it, it's not always easy to find good antibodies and to optimize them. So, and often the, the available antibodies are limited. So for some of these markers, sometimes we search um, commercial vendors and sometimes there are no antibodies available that are already validated for immunostochemistry almost on formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue sections for the targets and species of interest. Or sometimes we do find a few antibodies, but um, when we start trying them, we find that they work somewhat, but they're really not that great. And this brings me to the next point, is that a lot of the um, relatively poor sensitivity and specificity that we experience with many antibodies, um, this is really not an issue with the ish. That's something that we really like about the ish staining, is that the sensitivity is, is very high. 
as well as the, the sensitivity and specificity both are really high. And um, I'll show you an example later where I have side-by-side -side, um, ISH and IHC, and, and I can show the, um, how, how the ISH is performing much better and is more sensitive. We also tend to save a lot of time with ISH when we are faced with novel targets like these. Um, so as you probably know, when we get new antibodies for IHC, even though they often come with a recommended protocol, um, we really always have to optimize them on our, in our hands, on our instrument to get the best possible staining. And we have in our lab hundreds of different antibodies uh, for which we have protocols for IHC, and they each have a slightly different protocol, so different, different epitope retrieval, different primary antibody concentration, and so on. Um, so we need to keep track of that and, and optimize each antibody accordingly. That's really not the case for the RNA-ish. Um, for the RNA scope assay, we have one protocol that's been always the same for all the targets we've used, and it's always worked very well. So typically when we get we receive the probe, we just put it in the machine, we run it with the standard protocol, and on the first day we can start generating data. Um, that's quite different from the antibodies where often we spend a few weeks to optimize, you know, try a few different antibodies, optimize the same. So we save a lot of time. And then finally, um, we find that the uh, ish tends to be more suitable for quantitative assessment of target expression. And what do I mean by that? So going back to the immune cell markers, which we assess by immunohistochemistry, um, in this case, we're really only interested to know if a cell is positive or negative. So we're going to use image analysis um, to quantify or to, to um, classify these cells either as simply positive or negative, and then we're going to quantify how many positive cells are present per area of tumor tissue. So it, it's simply a, a positive versus negative cell. For this, we find that these markers work very well uh, with IHC. However, in the case of these three markers, the IL-10, TGF-beta, and CXCL-10, the scientific question was not simply um, positive versus negative, it was really about the um, degree or the amount of expression per cell within these um, samples. And for that, um, the ish is very well suited because the staining pattern is this punctate staining. So you see these little dots and you can actually count either manually or you can also do this with a software for image analysis you can quantify how many dots are present in each cell. And it's been shown uh, in some of the validation data of these assays that the number of dots per cell that you see on the stain correlates with the copy number per cell. Um, so that's quite quantitative. Um, IHC is not going to be uh, shown as dots. It's really you're going to see staining that is either cytoplasmic or nuclear or membrane. Um, you can try to quantify the intensity or what we would call the optical density of the chromogen with IHC. Um, but as many of you probably know, that is really often not recommended uh, because it is well known that the optical density or the intensity of chromogen with IHC is really not um, correlated in a quantitative manner to the amount of targets. So at best with IHC, you would get a very rough semi-quantitative assessment of how much protein is there. And we find that the ish is more quantitative. Um, so this is what I was just describing. We do have, um, these are the softwares we use, uh, QPath, which is open source, and Halo is a commercial software. Both of them have a very good algorithm for um, ish, where the dots within the cells will be detected, and then the cells can be, uh, or the number of dots per cell can be quantified and you can generate. Um, once you set this up, if once you have, a, if you have a good stain, you have good imaging, then uh, you set up your image analysis and then you can rapidly generate uh, in an automated manner um, a large amount of quantitative data. The other um, advantage uh, that I wanted to talk about briefly for the RNA-ish is the, um, the fact that we can really rapidly translate from sequencing data to morphologic analysis. 
Um, so the study I showed, in the study I showed, these three particular targets were identified as targets of interest from uh, single cell RNA sequencing data. So concurrently, as we were doing histology in these tumors, there were also some samples from the same study that were going for single cell RNA-seq analysis. Um, this generated a large amount of data, and after it was analyzed, it was found that um, it appeared that uh, these three targets were of particular interest. So then uh, the, uh, the user asked us if we could stain. Um, often, in my experience, the type of targets that are now identified on single cell RNA-seq um, are not the type of targets that we can easily find antibodies for. So these are some examples again. So we were able to rapidly go from the single cell RNA-seq to the staining of our tissue section to validate this data and analyze it further with the, um, the spatial aspect. But um, this rapid translation um, of the sequencing data to tissue section staining is also true in my experience, and that's something I, I wanted to show is, is also true and is very powerful if you're involved in, um, this is a very different type of study, but in novel pathogen discovery. So I want to talk briefly about this example. Um, being a core facility, we, we mostly um, support research done by other groups. However, we do have our own small research program. Uh, being uh, lab animal veterinarians and veterinary pathologists, we're interested in spontaneous diseases of lab animals, uh, including mice. And um, there is this disease called inclusion body nephropathy that had been observed for um, about the past 40 years by veterinary pathologists. Um, so it's a spontaneous disease of mice in which the um, kidneys undergo a chronic kidney disease that's characterized by tubular degeneration and necrosis, as we can see here on the right. Um, the kidneys eventually undergo interstitial fibrosis. They start to shrink and be misshapen. Uh, at that stage, often the mice will show evidence of clinical disease. They will become sick because of renal failure. They will have very high creatinine in their serum. And what's very interesting is that the tubules that are affected have these enlarged nuclei with intranuclear inclusion bodies shown by the arrows, which if you're familiar with um, pathology of infectious diseases, these type of inclusion bodies are highly suggestive of, of a virus as the cause of the disease. Um, we had been looking for a long time as a potential viral cause for this disease, and, and we could not find it with traditional methods. And that was until um, a few years ago with collaborators, we did um, viral metagenomic analysis of these um, kidneys from these uh, mice with chronic renal failure. So basically, see, did high throughput sequencing of these kidney tissues, and went, uh, we went hunting for any evidence of a novel viral sequence. And we did find it. So we did find uh, with our collaborators a sequence uh, that was present in multiple of these kidneys, the same sequence that was compatible with a parvovirus, but it was a it was compatible with a new or novel parvovirus species, which we named mouse kidney parvovirus. However, um, we needed to show not only that this virus sequence was present within the tissue affected by the disease, but we needed to prove causality. Um, and this was done by uh, multiple different um, experiments to show that this virus was indeed causing the inclusion body nephropathy. But one of the key um, experiments we did was with using RNA scope. So very rapidly after we got the sequence, we sent it um, to order a custom probe. In a couple of weeks, we had received our probe and then we uh, applied it to the tissue section and we were able to show these really beautiful images that showed how the viral RNA was present um, in the tissue. It was present in disease tissue. It was not present in kidney tissues of normal healthy mice. And also, um, spatially, it correlated. So you can see that the signal is present in these abnormal tubules with enlarged nuclei and showing attenuation of the epithelium that's consistent with tubular degeneration and not present in the normal tubules. So for pathologists, that's very powerful evidence if you have co-localization of the infectious agent with the um, lesion that uh, really support causality. We could have done this with immunosochemistry, but it would have taken probably a, a few months to develop an antibody. And actually, we eventually did that. So a few months later, we did have, in addition to our HISH, um, 
the um, immunostochemistry assay, it did show a similar pattern of staining. Um, but the fact that the ISH allowed, this, allowed us to do this so rapidly after the sequencing data was obtained um, really helped us to, you know, to get this published fairly rapidly and have very convincing data. We also found that um, even though the IHG worked very well in the kidney tissue, um, it was not as sensitive. So then after characterizing the disease in the kidneys, we wanted to know, even though there, were, there was no evidence of pathology in any other organs, we wanted to stain all other organs to see where else this virus may replicate in the mouth. And we did find it by ish um, in a small number of cells. And you see that the intensity of staining is, is much less than the kidneys, but you see these small dots within a few cells within the small intestine mucosa and the cecal mucosa. Um, and we found that this occurs actually very within a few days after we inoculate mice with this virus. That's the first place where we see it before it goes to the kidneys. So that's been very useful for us to study the pathogenesis of this infection. Um, but the staining is, is very, is much milder in the intestine. And actually when we applied our antibody to the intestine, even though in all the mice we could see the staining on ish, we never, never were able to visualize it with antibody. And we think that probably is because the amount of virus in the intestine is, is much, much lower than in the kidney. And the, um, we're just below the sensitivity threshold of the immunostochemistry assay. Um, this is another um, similar story, another novel mouse virus that we found in our facility. It's called urine astrovirus 2. It was discovered by viral metagenomics. Um, and we uh, rapidly, after obtaining the sequence, we ordered a probe. We were able to confirm that this virus was infecting our mice. We were able to study the pathogenesis of this virus and, and, and follow it in different tissues after experimental inoculation. Uh, but I also wanted to show this example because in this study, we combined the RNA probe for the astrovirus RNA um, with antibodies for different cell types. So this is the small intestine. On the left is the um, astrovirus probe in red and CD3 in green showing that uh, one of the main cell types that was infected in the small intestine were T cells with CD3, but there was also occasional co-localization with epithelial cells labeled with pancytokeratin um, antibody. So um, this was my last slide. This, co this concludes my presentation. Um, again, thank you, um, Anushka, for sharing this opportunity with uh, me today. Uh, I also want to thank everyone for being here, and um, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Anushka and Sebastian, for your informative presentations. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is for Anushka. Does RNA scope detect insertion and deletion of mutations? Anushka? Um, we seem to be having some connection issues. Let me ask a question for uh, Sebastian. Do the probes cross-react for the same target in different animal species? Um, so I, I think this is also possibly something Anushka may want to comment on since she's the expert on the technology, but I can give you my um, perspective as a, as a user of this technology. So. Uh, it, that's often a question we had when we ordered probe, and I think the answer is it depends how um, how uh, closely similar or different are the same gene in different species. Um, so uh, when we ordered a probe, we, we've asked this question before. So for example, and that's important to us because we often work, for example, with, with humanized mice where we want to detect only the human gene and not the same gene of the mouse. So we've asked this question before. And then um, they can run 
the uh, there is a probe design team at ACD. They can run uh, an analysis within their um, with using their algorithms, and they can tell us whether or not it would cross react. In some cases, they will say it would definitely not cross react. In some cases, they say it will. And the advice they gave us when the genes, if the gene is too close between the two species, um, the advice to us was to use, instead of the RNA scope assay, was to use the base scope assay because it can be more specific to um, shorter sequences. Okay. Um, let's try a question for Anushka. Does RNA scope detect insertion and deletion of mutations? Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Yeah, I just want to thank um, Dr. Monette for his time today and for that brilliant presentation. And for this question, um, our DNA scope assay, which is our new assay specifically designed to look at genomic DNA, that is the assay that uh, would help visualize these insertions and deletions. So not our RNA scope assay, but our uh, new DNA scope assay. Thank you. All right. Um, next question. This is for you, Anushka. Does this technology work for archival FFPE samples with poor RNA quality? Uh, great question. Um, I think Sebastian showed a few ex nice examples of archival FFPE samples, and a uh, short answer is yes, um, absolutely. Uh, the way the probes are designed, they span across a range of um, length of your target RNA, and they are basically a pooled probe of uh, about 20 ZZ pairs for RNA scope and about 1 to 3 ZZ pairs. So they are a set of probes, and that ensures that even for fragmented RNA, you will see some level of signal. So um, archival FFP tissues with poor RNA quality um, can be used with this technology. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question is for Sebastian. How do you choose between chromogenic and fluorescent assays? Yeah, so that's a that's a good question. Um, and I think, so as, as pathologists here in our lab, we, we tend to like the chromogenic assays because um, they really give us uh, a really good view of our tissue morphology. So, you know, we can look side by side at the h &E and the chromogenic slide. Uh, also, our pathologists can examine the chromogenic slides, you know, on their regular microscope at their desk. So it, it's just easier to look at them routinely. Um, however, to us, the reason to choose the fluorescence assay is really when we're trying to do some sort of colocalization staining. Um, there is a, uh, it is possible, and we have done a dual staining with chromogenic assay. It works fine if there's not overlap between the two signals. But I would say, and, and I think the same is true also, I'm sure people will be familiar with this and many people will probably agree. Like if you're using antibodies, uh, if there's going to be co-localization in, in the same cell, within the same cell compartment, let's say, cytoplasmic targets within the same cell, um, two chromogenic, um, chrom two chromogens overlapping is, is very difficult or impossible to assess. So then co-localization of multiple marker, multiplex staining, um, in my experience, is, is when you want to go with the fluorescence. Right, thank you. And it looks like we have time for one more question. Uh, this one, I think, is for Anushka. Is the new RNA protein co-detection kit available for automated assays? Uh, thanks for that question. Um, yes, our co-detection assay is available in both automated and manual platforms. So depending on whichever one you prefer and whether you have the instrument, you can use either. All right. Well, thank you again, Anushka and Sebastian, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, ACD, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. 
we encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.